like before I get started, actually, I will talk a little bit about you guys. Um, so, has anyone here um, ever done any any forensics? Like just a cool. Is anyone here actually like a professional forensics dude? Okay. Any, anyone here law enforcement or want to admit to it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I've, I've worked with law enforcement in my career as a forensic nice guy. So, huh? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, just say, right? like, um, just 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 didn't know my audience. So, um, so for me, I, I'm a um, should say actually say ex punk kid. Um, like, I ran New Zealand's first anonymous remailer. Um, I ran a sort of a publicly available hacking lab where you could you know, go in, own boxes, try to learn stuff, um, then a public website with an exploit archive and tools and that sort of thing, and so forth. And then I, I got a job, and for a while I um, looked after the New Zealand government website, and then for a while I looked after um, the giant supercomputer which was Weta Industries Render Wall, which was used to render Lord of the Rings. Um, I helped organize the first KiwiCon conference, which is going to happen in a couple of weeks. For anyone who's going to head down there, I heavily recommend it. It's a good time. Um, and I, having said that, I know how much effort it is to put on a conference, so I'd like to give a shout out to the Hash Days guys. This is, this is looking to be awesome. Um, nice hotel. <laughs> <laughs> this is important to me. This, you know, sort of runs around conference. Um, like, yeah, I support the hackerspaces scene. Um, like a C-based member, despite not living in Berlin. Also support like EFF, and I earn my crust these days as a security industry shill, as Chris pointed out, uh, <laughs> uh, doing doing incident response. Um, so I have a slightly different definition of hacking, but uh, like I'm uh, sure everyone does. For the purposes of this talk, hacking means gaining unauthorized access to a computer system, um, and. I diss on vendors a little bit during the talk, but for legal reasons, I keep it specifically vague. Um, I can't possibly talk too specifics unless I'm really drunk, so if you want to buy me beer afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's also some bits in this talk where obviously releasing code um, would be contrary to the purpose of the talk, uh, such as in the case of jurist mechanisms. Also, given that I am nominally a responsible guy these days, um, all of the techniques that I'm going to talk about here are either ones that have either been publicly talked about or one could infer with a modicum of common sense, I like to say. So I'm like, you know, not really teaching people to do bad stuff. So, so anyway, today I'm like going to be talking about anti-forensics. And this isn't just applicable for um, hackers and black hats and so forth. Um, this is actually very applicable for large corporates. Um, like the topic of data destruction, data destruction and data leakage outside of a large enterprise is actually quite a big deal these days. Um, I think every so often you hear uh, statistics about how many laptops the US military loses per whatever. Um, you know, anti-forensics is actually quite important in this case. Um, so sort of not just hackers, large corporates, activists is another one. Um, if you are unlucky enough to live in a place where you have a government that likes to torture people that disagree with them, this is all very applicable. Um, and generally, like people who just care about the privacy of their data, um, people who are concerned with copyright, legal issues, political figures, um, and also, of course, forensic analysts. Um, it's it's important to examine. <coughs> Uh, knowledge from both sides of the field, and this is something that has sunk in a long time ago in the pen testing industry. Uh, the method of breaking into a system to test its security is one that's you know, quite well established. Uh, it's not quite so common with forensic analysts. So a lot of this talk is from the perspective of someone trying to avoid uh, someone like me, or a forensic analyst. Um, so when I actually say, you know, we're trying to avoid cops, or we're trying to avoid forensic analysts, you know, bear in mind that Blah, blah, blah. don't want anyone to get offended. So, moving on. Forensics is a field which encompasses scientific methodology about uh, facts being ascertained regarding a certain event. An artifact, a physical item, typically in the movies a corpse. Um, generally this has very specific legal connotations. Um, we want to answer the following questions in order to come up with a convincing narrative about an event. Um, so, who were the people that broke in? What did they do? Uh, when did they do this? How did they get in? And generally, like, why did they do it? Was it for money? Did they do it for fame? Did they do it for laughs? Yeah. So forth. 
Um, so in legal cases, computer forensics is very commonly used to analyze a computer belonging to a defendant. Um, however, it's also additionally used to recover data in the event of hardware or software failure. Um, you're analyzing a computer after breaking. Uh, you're going to gather evidence against an employee that uh, enterprise wishes to terminate. Um, or you're just reverse engineering, perhaps you're gaining information about how computer systems work just for the purposes of debugging, greater knowledge, etc. So, common techniques in digital forensics. Right? Um, primarily, evidence acquisition is one that anyone who does any forensics is generally familiar with. Um, most commonly, this is disk imaging. There's a lot of different ways to do this. Of course, sysadmins use DDs, a DD. Um, a lot of forensics guys do it with NCASE or some sort of custom tool. Professional government teams frequently have some sort of road warrior kit like this where they just slap in a hard drive, press a button, and it does all the magic for you. Um, recovering deleted information is also another common one, and this is what is most commonly known as digital forensics uh, and most commonly understood by law enforcement. So if someone is leaking corporate data or has child pornography, which is like a big thing in forensics, well, you understand what I mean. Um, someone frequently seizes a computer, tries to find evidence of wrongdoing, and if people are trying to cover their tracks, the first thing they do is delete the data that they shouldn't have. Um, this is quite a dull end of forensics, and I don't care that much about it. Uh, I'm more interested in the unauthorized access to systems type of cybercrime. Um, so, for that, um, with regard to that, other techniques that are frequently used to discover hackers, I described, is um, file system forensics, frequently things like timelining, um, log analysis, uh, keyword searches. Um, for instance, I was once doing incident response for a company that had been rather seriously owned, and after finding this guy's custom rootkit, uh, we found that he had actually left this large stream of invective inside the rootkit about how much he hated sysadmins, large corporations, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so when the rootkit was loaded into memory, it was actually left really, really distinctive traces. Because there's not many, many times that you would see the phrase, admins can suck my dick, um, and, <laughs> you know, in memory normally. Um, so, yeah. Um, so in terms of detection, um, this is a reasonably well-known area, so I'm not going to go over it very fast, but uh, I'll go over it quite quickly. Um, IDSs were initially created and they were basically like an off-duty cop that was sort of pulling a shift um, at a shopping mall, right? They couldn't actually do anything. They noticed an intrusion and they'd like make a phone call to headquarters and say, look, I think something went wrong, you should probably do something about it. And these days we have HIPs, which is a bit more proactive. Um, Firewall logs, there's a lot of enterprise logging tools that will perform statistical analysis for you, let you know if they think something bad is going on. Um, and more commonly these days, you've got file system integrity checking, um, which is basically a common technique where you compare hashes of known good values. Um, there's a bunch of open source databases about this. Uh, this is actually a really good idea. Like, there's a lot of pseudoscience in the security industry, um, <coughs> AV and that sort of thing. Um, but whitelisting files is actually like, quite a smart idea. Like, if you actually have a list of all the binaries which you want to run in your enterprise and a mechanism by which to stop execution of stuff that you don't authorize to run, then this is actually a really good security method. Um, there's commercial tools which will do this. If you are a little more hard up, uh, the NSRL provides an open source database of um, hashes. Unfortunately, it's quite good for Windows, but really, really bad for anything else. Um, there's almost nothing for OSX or, or Linux or FreeBSD. The Shmoo group used to maintain something called knowngoods.org, which was an awesome online database of you know, file hashes and that sort of thing. But unfortunately, they've stopped maintaining it. It's deprecated. There's a lot of commercial tools you can buy which will do other things. Um, some of these are really good. Some of these are really, really poor. Uh, most commonly, AV varies wildly in quality. Um, I've performed statistical analysis of um, AV software against file samples, and the difference of percentage of detection amongst major vendors can vary up to about 
I'm not going to name names because AV vendors are really litigious. Um, I'm not going to go through all the software either because it's largely dull. However, it's worth mentioning in case, which is generally the default forensic software which is used by law enforcement and professional forensics guys. Um, it provides acquisition, uh, advanced image recovery, case processing, does lots and lots of logic on the file system. It'll analyze the registry, show you what's supposed to start on boot, uh, what it thinks is suspicious activity, etc. It's, 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 it's quite cool. Um, there's even a, a common joke in the forensics community that if you didn't want to get caught by police, what you should do is you should use RiserFS because NCASE didn't support it, so the police wouldn't know how to analyze it. Um, <laughs> however, <laughs> in case has spoiled the joke in that a month ago they finally got riser support like what a year after development on it stopped because Hans riser killed someone um, <laughs> that's not funny <laughs> but, um, so it, it, it's got despite having a lot of whizzy stuff it's got a lot of problems right um, it's, it's OSX support is pretty poor uh, sometimes it gives just plain misinformation about it um, although that, that is getting better. Um, it doesn't really support FileVault. Um, however, it does support PGP, SGEZ, BitLocker, EFS, and a variety of other uh, forensic formats, uh, encryption formats. Um, however, using, them for non -window, using it for non-Windows hosts is actually still reasonably painful. Uh, the, the problem with it being, I guess, the most popular software is that it's actually come under a fair amount of scrutiny. And there's even been a few public exploits for it. A couple of years ago, some guys demonstrated that you could load a malformed file system into NCASE and it would actually exploit the tool and allow arbitrary uh, code execution on the forensic analyst's workstation. Um, this is a non-optimal anti-forensic technique. While this is hilarious, um, it's actually quite, quite conspicuous. <laughs> like, a guy who's performing forensic analysis of your machine may be a little bit more paranoid than your average sysadmin. And so, you know, risk, risk factor is high. Um, another tool that I'm briefly going to mention, just because it actually uh, made quite a splash about almost exactly a year ago, uh, was coffee. Uh, and just because this isn't actually a very big deal at all. Um, coffee is an essential tool to doing forensics, but it, the stuff you drink, not, not the tool that was released by Microsoft. Does everyone remember, remember this, what happened? Yeah. So yeah, like Coffee was developed by this former Hong Kong police officer who now works as like a senior investigator at Microsoft. And he conceived of this device after some discussions at a Microsoft conference, and it's used by like over 2,000 police officers in like 15 countries. And it's, it's basically just this modified flash drive uh, for sort of doing quick forensic investigations largely for non-technical police stuff. Um, it's just, you know, an automated tool. There's nothing particularly groundbreaking in top coffee that does not exist elsewhere. Um, there's no crazy methods of you know, memory dumping or anything like that. I guess the excitement around the software was that it was really difficult to obtain. Um, and forensic experts and the anti-forensic community, everyone was like, wow, there's this Microsoft tool, what does it do? Everyone's really interested. And then it leaked, and people had a look at it. And these are the list of commands that it actually ran. Um, which is, you know, not particularly crazy at all. Like, all of these are readily available from Sys internals and the MS resource kits. Um, however, Microsoft was gracious enough to provide switch operators for all the commands you see. So, you know. Um, and, predictably, some guys wrote something called DCAF. Um, and this provided real-time monitoring for coffee. And, like, coffee signatures on USB sticks and running applications. So, upon seeing coffee, DCAF would do a variety of things. Uh, it would clear logs, eject the USB device, uh, and contaminate and spoof MAC addresses, clear cookies, all this sort of thing. This also will not defeat real forensic analyst analysis. Um, all it would do is really piss off the cop that's trying to look at your machine. Um, and this is essentially, essentially a media stunt to piss off Microsoft. Um, so, Joking aside, uh, some key tenets of forensics to sort of keep in mind as we move forward, right? Is we've got detection, data recovery, data passing, and data analysis, da analyst, data analysis of digital artifacts. Um, so, so frequently, this is stuff like basically anything that you can quantify digitally: pictures, video, email, set as common with standard police investigation, uh, the stuff that we're more interested in: file systems and logs. 
Now, log, logging is a really boring topic, um, generally, but logs aren't just, just syslog anymore. What, what people can be logging these days is quite in depth. Um, so Immunity recently pre-released something called El Jefe, which isn't really publicly available yet, but it's a tool for logging process execution under Windows. So it will log every time a process is spawned. The idea being that if you see a process spawn in a production environment that you've never seen spawn in a dev environment, then you have a pretty good idea that something has actually gone very badly wrong. Uh, and this is actually a really good idea. Uh, if you don't want to pay for a tool to do this, uh, you could set up something yourself rather trivially under Windows using WMI. Uh, various branches of Unix have actually had process accounting for quite a while. So, I mean, if someone is actually incorporating this type of logging in the environment, then it actually raises the bar for detecting people quite significantly. Um, so, like anything, this type of logging can be avoided, but it makes things a lot more difficult. So, we should probably actually start speaking about avoidance, which is generally what we're, we're here to discuss. So, are we all good on what forensics is? No one's too freaked out? Awesome. Right. So, anti-forensics is a set of techniques designed to, to subvert defy and frustrate a forensic analyst. Um, generally this is either through obfuscating evidence, ensuring evidence is never created. Uh, the latter is obviously better than the former, but is frequently harder. Now, the type of technique that you're going to employ really depends on the sort of analysis you're trying to avoid. Um, to paraphrase Bruce Schneier about cryptography, there's anti-forensic techniques which will stop someone from getting fired when they've been looking at pornography at work, and then there's the type of anti-forensic techniques which will keep someone out of prison or from being tortured. Um, so we're going to focus around techniques which are used primarily in two situations. Um, one where someone is worried about uh, their being pressured, someone is performing analysis on a box at their home or in front of them, which has been confiscated from them. Uh, maybe it's where their nuclear plans are, formula which controls the free market, or whatever. Um, and techniques to avoid detection on boxes which they remotely control in the wild, perhaps if they've been doing active research. Uh, there's a variety of other stuff. Like I'm going to ignore st um, some important parts of this field for the sake of brevity. Uh, steganography, which is the art and science of writing hidden messages in a way that no one apart from the sender and the recipient can actually suspect the existence of the message. That's sort of one of the most obscure forms of security through obscurity. Very interesting, I'm not going to touch it. Um, Packing, which is a method of obscuring a binary that you run on a remote system to make reversing uh, difficult. Again, I'm not really going to touch it. It's a very interesting topic, but we'll take an entire talk. So, what am I going to talk about? So, anti-forensics. Um, the core tenets, as described here, um, inspiration for laying it out so clearly, has to go to the Grug and Bill Blunden, uh, both of whom are pioneers in this field. Uh, so, data destruction, uh, the idea of leaving as little evidence behind as possible. Um, you want to hide what you do leave behind, and what you have to leave behind, perhaps if you're trying to persist your rootkit, for example. Um, data transformation, even, even if what you do leave behind is hidden, it should be really difficult to analyze how it's found. So, it should be packed, encrypted, etc. Um, obviously, this is a double-edged sword. Any time you get too clever, your signature becomes more distinctive. Um, I've seen someone attempt to lay in uh, a rootkit with a custom packet that they themselves had created. Um, because the binary was packed in such a bizarre way, it actually set off the heuristics of an antivirus in the system. So the guy sort of looks at it, goes, mm, unpacks it, then lays in the rootkit, and it went in fine. However, the way he actually got caught was because the antivirus had initially frustrated his custom technique. Um, having said that, it was also easy to spot what his technique was after that and create a signature to detect other things this guy had done. So, um, as I said, there's various trade-offs using this. Uh, data fabrication is a really interesting one. Um, again, it's tricky, it has merit. So, this is an idea where you basically lead a forensic analyst down a false path to a potential red herring. So, Essentially, a forensic analyst is someone who just has to do a job at the end of the day, which is to describe what has happened to the system. Mm -hmm. If you can present some common malware to the guy, then he may potentially write this up as a report, say I've done my job, collect his fat cash, drive off in his fast car, and 
you know, everyone's happy at the end of the day. Um, if he can explain the aberrant behavior on this, then this may work. This is very subtle though, and should only really be attempted under advanced circumstances. Uh, the best idea is obviously don't create anything to analyze in the first place. Um, so let's examine these in a bit more depth. Uh, in order to understand data destruction, you'll have to know a little bit how file systems work. And I'm not going to labor this point. Um, does everyone here understand how file systems work? Or should I go really quickly? Yes, no? So basically, you have uh, generally something which stores met metadata about files. Um, like under Unix, you have a super block which contains basic information about the file system, block size, number of blocks, number of blocks per group, total inodes, etc. Uh, you have inodes which store file metadata. Uh, under Windows, you have something called the MFT, and this stores metadata about files, and if they're small, frequently the files itself. Uh, it's worth noting, for instance, space in the MFT is never recovered. This never gets cleared out. So, as most of you know, when you delete files on a computer, they don't really get deleted. Um, file system merely removes pointers to the files and says that these blocks are free to be reallocated and rewritten. Um, so given the size of modern disks, dependent on disk purpose, it can frequently be unlikely that the stuff, the space, actually ever gets reused. So someone can come back through it and recover it. So we want to get rid of file residue, old inodes, directory entries, data blocks. So there's a variety of tools for doing this. Um, Shred, um, I think, is a part of core GNU utils these days. Um, there's part P PGP um, contains one. Uh, OSX now has a secure disk uh, erasure function built in. So the problem is that a lot of these tools do not work like you'd expect. Um, and there's a lot of myths going around about secure deletion. The most common of which is the electron microscope myth. Um, so a New Zealander, who's actually a very, very smart guy, called Peter Goodman, um, who was part of the cracking on digital passport effort that happened recently, um, almost every time someone talks about secure deletion, in fact, I believe if you man shred on Unix, it actually mentions him, says the Goodman method stipulates a 37 time random pass to wipe data. This is heavily excessive. And he is the first person to say this. Like he was talking about this in 1990 when disks were 20 meg, right? And now you have like a two terabyte disk. The chances that the theoretical, theoretical electron microscope attack will work is pretty much zip. Um, so this is largely like a unicorn, a myth, however it is one that really persists and is most commonly talked about when people discuss secure deletion. Um, I don't think anyone has ever gone to jail because of this. Um, but our problem is, is that do, do secure deletion tools really work? Um, do they really do what we want them to and do we really know what we want them to do? Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, about that. So I've actually had a look at these tools, and again, without naming names, um, we've got tools that claim to be counter forensic erasure tools, you know, if you're worried about keeping dodgy stuff from your wife or whatever. Um, then these tools, you know, window washer, evidence eliminator, cyber scrub, internet cleaner, you know, there's actually a lot of these tools out there for the, the reasonably paranoid internet user. Um, a lot of these things, like they, they fail to overwrite unallocated space properly. Uh, they fail to clear slack space, which is different, but we'll get into slack space a bit later. They fail to even get all the application specific data. Um, in the case of um, one of the tools which I will name, Shred, because it's part of uh, core GNU utils, I uh, would say Venema, who was an early author of the Sleuth Kit, actually discovered that Shred, because of delayed file system writes, actually repeatedly overwrote an in-memory copy of the program rather than the on-disk copy, still leaving contents of the, in the file item, um, which is you know, obviously a fail. Um, so basically, yeah, you should, you should always actually check yourself to make sure when it comes to secure deletion. Uh, look at the disk yourself. There's public tools for doing this that are free and open source. Uh, you can do it with hex dump. Have a hex dump. Look at your disk with hex dump. And if you see data, I mean, you know what it looks like. Um, 
So there's, there's more extreme examples of, of data deletion, right? Um, so you can, you can just totally vaporize everything. There's actually a, um, a bootable CD, which is quite reliable for doing this. Um, and I, I performed a frequency analysis of a hard drive after someone has used direct boot and you. And it's, it's pretty sound. It's not like completely random, but there's definitely nothing real there. Um, you can do interesting things to your files and your file system if you want. I've seen this technique postulated and people actually do stuff like this. So you could, you could like, change the headers of all the files in your file system so they can't be recognized. This would be really irritating if someone had to get the data back, but it's highly conspicuous and bizarre to do. However, I have seen someone who's postulated modifying the checksum of all the files. So when someone actually does uh, like hash analysis, every file on the file system looks suspect. Um, which is, again, yeah, an interesting technique. I, I personally wouldn't use it, but um, as I mentioned before, um, attacking, attacking the examiner's tools is, is another possibility. Um, I mentioned the in-case overflow. However, um, a lot of forensic tools are basically full of parsers. And anyone who's done any exploit dev knows that parsers are massively prone to, uh, being, to, to, to attacks. Um, so, InCase has a lot of parsers, as does ProDiscover, as does FTK. Um, however, there's other techniques you could use that still work, that are kind of all against these, like zip bombs. Does everyone remember those? So, if you have a forensic tool, and what it does is it unpacks complicated file formats for you, so you can look at everything, right? And you hit, show me zip files on the system. It's going to automatically attempt to look inside all the zip files. If you have one of those like 42.zip, which expands to something like 4.5 petabytes from 42 <laughs> bytes or something, right? Like you will crash this tool. Uh, again, this is kind of a jerk move. Uh, not necessarily a great idea, but still funny. Um, so rm-rf is a popular one. Um, it's kind of slow and sort of unsound. Um, there's, there's probably better ways of making your data unreadable or torching your file system as well. I mean, this is always subject to the control C um, attack as well. Um, this is a more extreme way of dealing with your data. Um, <laughs> thermite is good. I have a mate who recommends a shotgun. Um, when I was working for the government and I was paid to securely delete data, I used to use a blowtorch. Um, <laughs> Many organizations, however, employ commercial disk crushers and shredders. I have never attempted to perform analysis on a shredded disk, but it looks pretty difficult. Um, <laughs> when, <laughs> like, when, I was, when I was younger and a bit more paranoid, me and my friend sat um, up one night and created a dead man switch. And so the idea was, was that I had a pile of thermite on top of my hard drive, uh, a strip of magnesium and a butane lighter pointed at it, and this mechanism would trigger if I failed to enter in certain keystrokes every day. Um, and so therefore, if I was in prison and they came to raid my pad in the night and the man, you know, blah, 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 then, you know, my data would vape. However, um, after some discussion, we realized that we would probably burn ourselves to death while drunk. Um, so this was never actually implemented. However, if you're going to prepare for the worst, which is, as I said, every every young punk's fear that the government has nothing better to do than come for him in the night, um, and secure deletion of thermite is not an option, um, then there's always duress countermeasures. Now, putting these sorts of measures in place, this is a joke, by the way. Um, you know, I, 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 I heart the TSA, really. Uh, as much as is possible. Uh, so anyone putting in place any sort of duress countermeasure, uh, this, this is basically saying that you know you're going to get in serious trouble at some point. Um, additionally, this can also be considered a booby trap, which may be of questionable legality depending on where you live. Um, having said that, the fact that you're doing this probably means you don't care. Maybe you're a dissident in an oppressive regime uh, where if someone finds um, examples of literature or materials that are not approved by the state, you will be tortured. You probably care more about not people not finding this. Um, maybe you just don't like being harassed by airport security. I don't know. Um, so certain types of duress countermeasures only work under certain situations. Uh, they will probably not avoid full proper forensic analysis. Um, however, it may help you avoid cursory investigations. Um, so the law, the law, for instance, when it comes to encrypted data these days is very interesting. 
Um, in a lot of places, you can be made to give up your encryption keys, or you can be held indefinitely. Um, this scenario does actually happen to people. They can get dragged into rooms at the airport at customs and be told that they will not be let go until they decrypt the data that they have. So at this stage, one would have to log in and turn over all their evidence to law enforcement. Um, and presumably what happens when you do that is your home the decrypts, your screen unlocks, and you know, they can look through your data. However, what, what would you like to happen when you log in under these circumstances? I mean, primarily you just love to log into a clean computer where everything looks good and happy and there's nothing dodgy there. Additionally, you'd probably like to be able to see what people are doing, like poking around your data. Um, a couple of scripts in a pan config will actually permit you to use a magic Jurius password, uh, which means that when it's entered at any system prompt, uh, i.e. like, you know, your login, screensaver, sudo, whatever, special actions will get carried out. So um, you'd use this in a situation where you believe someone's going to compel you to provide your password and you want to deny them access to certain information on your system. It would appear like a normal password in the sense that it gives access to your system and it would appear that you're complying with the demands made of you, but in the background would carry out like a configured duress action. Like maybe you would delete key rings on your computer, kill your browser, remove your browser cache, you would unmount encrypted file systems, uh, you would fill in slack space on file systems, whatever it is you would actually want to do. Um, then you could probably start something like Xvid or Istanbul and actually make a video of them like searching around your file system, you know what I mean? Whatever it is you want to do. Um, and then, and then. So obviously this gets kind of interesting, right? Like there's a bit of an arms race thing going on here. Like I knew someone who was working on a system by which he wanted to load a complete clean virtualized operating system under the nose of someone who was actually attempting to perform analysis on his computer. Um, this is a very bold technique and I wish him luck. I've known people that have booby trapped their file systems in a variety of interesting ways. A friend of mine deployed a technique where he aliased LS to shut down dash R. Um, this was a great booby trap. Like he set it off himself repeatedly. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> so the reason why there is discussion of solutions like this is because the traditional stance of like you'll never read my data because I have crypto isn't that practical anymore. Um, however, you might argue that it never really was. Um, you guys all know what rubber hose cryptanalysis is? <laughs> People are freaking with that. Does anyone in the audience want to explain it? Someone? Put their hand. Come on. Okay, come on, Chris. You beat the shit out of somebody until they give you what you want. Right. <laughs> so traditionally, this was a rubber hose, uh, hence the name. Um, so it's a euphemism, right, for extracting cryptographic secrets from a person by coercion, uh, in contrast to any sort of technical <coughs> attack. Um, so you just, yeah, beat them with the rubber hose until they're like, I'm sorry, my password is, you know. Um, so, along the lines of duress mechanisms, um, another thought experiment which people have come up with technical solutions for under these circumstances is deniable encryption. And this is encryption that allows its user to deny that they ever encrypted a file system or a file, even if they did. Uh, the idea being to reduce the effectiveness of coercive interrogation or other compulsion mechanisms. Um, so the first public implementation of this was something actually called rubber hose, and it was the Linux 2.2 kernel. And as a side note, it was actually Julian Assange was one of the co-authors of this uh, back when he was a cryptographer and not a journalist. Um, <laughs> so this basically works like this. Uh, you overwrite um, an entire device with random data, and within the data you have multiple encrypted partitions and then you have passwords which will decrypt each partition. However, you can't tell how many partitions are available um, and so therefore there is no way for the person being tortured to prove that they've given over all the data that, um, that is available to be given. And so hence there's no reason for them to stop torturing you. Um, in which case, you might as well not give up any data at all. Um, now, this is a pretty grim scenario. These, these are all pretty grim scenarios. And like, as interesting as these potential problems and possible solutions are, they mean that basically this has already happened. Um, this is not where you want to be. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about 
uh, concealment and how people avoid getting into situations where they're being compelled to do things. Um, so if we take a stroll down memory lane, the first thing that anyone ever learned to do or learned to spot was to look at timestamps. And so it was the first thing people did when they broke into machines was change timestamps of files that they changed. Um, this is actually still really important, right? Like the file system is one of the best pieces of evidence that you have. Um, and likely to be one of the most extensively examined. Um, with the touch command under Unix, you could change two of the three timestamps, uh, which are recorded by the file system. Uh, Vinny Lou wrote a tool called Time Stomp on Windows, which allows you to change the four that NTFS um, records. Other things that people used to do to hide files, you know, the old double dot technique, because when you typed ls, you couldn't see it. Um, ADS was common, like uh, alternative data streams in Windows. Uh, you can append anything to the end of a file and it doesn't show up in explorer.exe. Um, post Vista, you could actually, uh, there was a, uh, an argument that an operator that could be passed to the dir command which would allow you to see this. For some reason, you still can't see alternate data streams in explorer.exe. I don't know why Redmond hasn't implemented this. I'm sure they have a reason for it. But basically, it's as simple as doing something like that, right, you, to hide something in an alternate data stream. And then you can just do that to run it. Uh, but it won't show up in Explorer. Um, these are pretty basic techniques. And more elegant and complicated things have been invented in the last decade. However, while we're strolling down memory lane, kick it forward a couple of years, and a basic technique which has existed since the dawn of time, since Clifford Stoll and the cuckoo's egg, if any of you guys remember that, um, is the process of analyzing traffic to enumerate a malicious intruder on your network. And despite the motivations of hackers, hacktivists, APT, cyber terrorists, the actions of hackers have remained reasonably similar, you know. The large motivation being to gain access, create persistence, and steal data. And then to avoid getting caught. And uh, nothing alerts an engineer more to the presence of a breach in the network than a reverse SSH tunnel going out of the network to Chinese IP space. Um, so in order to avoid obvious detection, people started tunneling. Um, so they started tunneling, I was going to say around 2002, but that's not actually true. Like, people discovered a long time ago that you could tunnel anything over anything. I mean, the bulk of traffic on the internet these days is tunneled over HTTP. Um, however, core tenets of tunneling for fun and profit as a bad guy uh, stay as close to the common packet structure and official protocol as you can, encrypt all the data that you transmit, and break up large payloads into small chunks. Um, so around 2002, which is why I used it, there were a couple of projects which gained popularity. Uh, one of which was NSTX, which provided DNS tunneling capability. And this has gotten increasingly more press in the age of Wi-Fi. Um, some people probably DNS tunneled on their way here to get free internet traffic. Um, the idea being that you know most Wi-Fi hotspots leave port 43 UDP unfirewalled outbound to the internet. So you can just tunnel everything over this. Um, while this works reliably, it's, it's pretty, pretty slow. Um, in 2002, this guy called uh, Peter Kietlka, um released a tool called ICMP Shell, which is basically a Telnet-like protocol. And it allows users to connect to a remote host, open a shell, issue commands, only using ICMP. It's pretty cool. Uh, this got updated in 2008 by a dude called John Blackscombe, uh, and he wrote ICMP TX. So um, while, while these basic techniques have remained the same for quite a while, analysis of network traffic to watch attackers has gotten a little bit more thorough. Um, largely due to the fact that these days, if you wanted to, you could save all your traffic. Uh, I mean, a two terabyte disk these days costs about 300 bucks. So it's actually feasible that you could save all your traffic all the time and come back and look at it. Um, which is something that is definitely worth keeping in mind uh, for would-be evaders of network forensics. Um, so there have been New advances though in the field, as I mentioned before, specifically in areas of you know, data concealment, uh, data obfuscation, and data contraception. Um, 
Now, a big player in the security industry days is uh, Metasploit, and they, they had a suite called Mafia. Um, and these tools were created by a guy called Vinnie Lou, Timestop, which I've mentioned for changing timestamps on Windows, uh, Meterpreter, which is now mainstream, which is their uh, in-memory intrusion framework, so you don't leave data on disk, um, and a thing that he used called Slacker. So Slacker was a technique by which you could hide a file in Slack space. So the Windows operating system uses fixed size clusters to store data. Uh, an entire cluster is used even if a file doesn't, the data being stored doesn't fill it. So the space between the end of the file and the end of the cluster is called Slack space. Uh, this is obviously an appealing place to store data that we don't want people to see. Um, unfortunately, these days, most standard forensics tools can dump and analyze Slack space. Additionally, a lot of systems, system administrators are proactive and they take the measure of periodically wiping Slack space. Um, also, Windows guys, Windows guys at Redmond kind of got a bit hip to this, and post 2K3 operating systems actually zero out Slack space in its entirety in the uh, set end of file call. However, against a stock XP or 2K3, host this should still work. <laughs> the reason why this picture is here is because large JPEGs are a great place are great files that are frequently full of slack space to hide things. Um, however, a slightly trickier technique, which is a bit cooler, is in-band file concealment. So this guy called the Grug wrote an amusingly titled paper in FRAC called Fist, Fist, Fist. It's all in the wrist. Uh, where he presented something called the Defiler's Toolkit. Um, and he had four techniques in this. Uh, RuneFS hid data by storing it in the system's bad blocks file. Uh, KYFS conceals data by placing it in directory files. Uh, DataMuleFS hid data by uh, burying it in reserved inode space. And WaffenFS, which I quite like, um, <laughs> used <laughs> a journaling file system. So for people that know Linux at all, ext2 and ext3 file systems are almost exactly the same. However, ext3 has the advantage of having a file system journal. However, you can mark a file system as an ext3 file system as ext2 without anyone really noticing. It'll get mounted, it's just the journal won't get used. And this leaves the file system journal available, which gives you about 32 meg of space for you to store your tools in without people noticing. Um, <laughs> so these techniques, though, however, once, once public, are detectable for anyone looking for them. Um, and so it's still a good idea to encrypt your data. Um, I, the popular open source toolkit, Sleuthcat, uh, has a tool called JCAT, which is JournalCat, right? Specifically for detecting this type of attack. Um, a very similar sort of technique for NTFS uh, was this quite cool file system called FragFS. Now, um, in, in the, the MFT file is a central repository for metadata on the NTFS file system. Uh, it's a file, and uh, its starting location is given in the boot sector. And every file and directory has at least one entry in this. And as I mentioned before, this space is never recovered. Um, now, only the first 42 bytes of any MFT entry has a specific defined purpose. Uh, after that, parts of the file are stored, um, or storing file attributes. On average, it was found that there's a, around 600 free bytes per MFT entry. The average Windows box on XP has about 100,000 MFT entries. So that, that's a lot of free bytes. Um, mostly it was found further that there was about 60% of these entries were free to use. That's around 36 meg of free space. Uh, a guy called Irby Thompson and Matthew Monroe released this at Black Hat 2K6. Um, and they even wrote a kernel device driver so you could execute files from FragFS, which was, again, very cool. Um, but being good guys, they also wrote a tool to detect suspicious entries in the MFT. So using this technique, you would, you would probably get caught. Um, one that can also seem appealing, um, like while hiding data in the file system is interesting, you might get the urge to hide it in executables. And while this has definite appeal, major issue doing so is that this would change your files checksum and you'd automatically raise flags. Um, what we would need to do in this case is find a binary file that changes frequently and hide our data there. Um, an obvious choice for this potentially under Windows would be the registry, uh, which is a large binary blob uh, which changes constantly. 
So you could encrypt a file and then um, split it up into rich binary values and just stuff it into the registry. Um, if someone was looking for this, this would obviously be incredibly noisy. Do you see this massive binary data shoved into the registry? If they weren't, however, this would probably work okay. Um, so the main way in which we actually get there is generally remote exploitation of software. Combined with credential theft, these are the two most common methods. These provide the two most common methods of breaking into computers. Um, once people have broken in, generally, you know, you clear logs, store rootkits, start thieving data, trampling around the file system, making a lot of noise, or, or perhaps not. Um, due to the rise of commercial exploitation frameworks, due to the rise of the security industry, people want to buy commercial tools, um, the complexity of the exploit payload has increased considerably. Um, there's, I have listed some in-memory intrusion frameworks here that all use different techniques. Uh, but what they all allow is network proxying, interactive access to a host, and the ability to launch programs, all without touching the file system, or in many cases, without visibly spawning another process over the one that was originally exploited. Um, so as I said, they use a variety of different techniques, but canonically, uh, an example is a tool which invokes a server that offers uh, access to its own address space or that of another process. You can upload a binary into this, uh, map and initialize the binary, and then you'll pass control of the program to the entry point of the binary so you can execute it. Uh, one of the first tools to do this was a tool called rexec, which involved using a combination of GDB and a custom user land library written by the Grud. Um, Syscall proxying is one that's used by Core Impact's tool. Uh, this involves installing a stub in memory on a remote machine which acts as a proxy for low-level system calls. Um, I see there's others. If you want to play with it, one that is actually free and reasonably well maintained is Meterpreter. Um, this is actually very cool and very easy to use. However, as Anonymous said, don't try to teach yourself how to use this under the security camera at the airport. Um, <laughs> however, staying memory resident means that file system analysis will not show any evidence of your behavior and there's no binaries to reverse. Um, this isn't necessarily the most persistent method of access, however it does leave the most evidence. Uh, for people who are trying for greater persistence, then rootkits are frequently the common port of call. Um, these have gained increasing complexity over the years, um, and there's a couple of guys from F-Secure talking about recent rootkit landscape at midday, I'll definitely be checking that out. Um, However, we've seen anti-forensic rootkits. A guy called Darren Bilby uh, wrote a bus driver rootkit, or filter driver, to intercept sysread calls to lie about the contents of disk to DD. Uh, Joanna Rutowska recently, well, a couple of years ago, claimed to have invented a truly invisible rootkit uh, called Blue Pill, the claim being that virtualization was supposed to be undetectable, and so the only way that Blue Pill could be detected is if the virtualization itself was detectable, and therefore the virtualization was flawed, not the rootkit. Um, <laughs> We have database rootkits. One that was really cool a couple of years ago was a rootkit called Deeper Door, which was a NIC firmware rootkit. This wrote itself onto the NIC firmware and used the GPU to do its processing, therefore bypassing use of the CPU completely, uh, which is very, very cool. Um, BIOS kits are a pretty interesting idea. Um, if tools are available when performing forensic analysis, it's a good idea to take a snapshot of the BIOS and whatever firmware you can during an incident. Uh, just because frequently on modern computers, there's about 20 different places with rewritable firmware. Um, that's a lot of places for people to attempt to maintain persistence. However, it's a very architecture-specific attack. It's not very portable and only really practical if someone's going after a really high-profile attack target. Um, <coughs> which brings me to phone switch rootkits, which you guys might remember. This was the scandal in Greece, where some guys wrote a custom rootkit for uh, Ericsson phone switch so there's a lot of speculation about who did this. It involved a lot of low level knowledge. But the payoff was that they ended up tapping the phones of a really large number of high profile officials in, in Greece. Um, so there's been a lot of advances in this area. Uh, it's not all just runaway for the black hats and the rootkit developers. There's been some notable advances in the forensic side. Um, most impressively perhaps in memory forensics. Um, the most common of memory forensic frameworks is probably volatility, um, which works on a set of memory profiles. So if you get a memory image from a WinXP box, then it contains 
profiles which describe common structures where they'll exist and so forth. Uh, it's written in Python, it's easily extensible, and there's modules out there uh, like Malfine and so forth which can be used to find common techniques that rootkits use to hide in memory. Um, Linux, you can use the Red Hat Crash utility to dump memory. We used to be able to access dev mem or on Windows backslash backslash physical memory, but operating system vendors got wise to this a few years ago and decided that directly exposing memory to people was a bad idea. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we, we have to use external drivers now. Um, frequently, as, as is common, um, we're a little bit behind on OS X because there isn't as much security focus on the operating system. Um, Matthew Switch released a paper on analyzing the Hyper file, um, but the there is still not a public driver for dumping memory on OS X. There are, however, some private ones out there. Um, one of the problems with these tools is that they run on the system that they're processing. So for a start, memory is very volatile, so merely running the tool changes the state of the thing that you're trying to record. Uh, secondly, it's possible, as we've seen, that software may reside on the system created specifically to lie to you. Uh, there's even a rootkit written by uh, Sherry Sparks and Jamie Butler uh, called Shadow Walker, which used page table manipulation um, to specifically return benign memory when the pages that the rootkit resided in were asked for. Um, so it would be preferable if there was a RAM acquisition tool that existed outside of the space of, that was being dumped. Um, so this isn't a new idea. Are there any people here who have used Solaris? Whoa, man, I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> but Spark Architecture actually had this idea via the open boot firmware. You could just hit stop A, type sync, and it would uh, write a crash dump of memory to disk. Um, on Intel hardware, a guy named Joe Grand, who a lot of you might have heard of, back in 2003, came up with a PCI card that had a physical switch on the back that was turned off most of the time, so it was not accessible by the operating system, and when you turned it on, the PCI would comment, the Tribble card, would commandeer the PCI bus, suspend the processor, and utilize DMA to copy out the contents of memory. Uh, it's pretty sweet. Doesn't tamper with memory. It's pretty hard to lie to. Um, you can't see that it's being used before it's turned on. Downside of this, however, is that you have to install it before you get owned, uh, which is, <laughs> is tough. Um, however, a physical method for acquiring memory which works on devices um, that have Firewire uh, was pioneered back in 2006 at RuxCon by a guy called Adam Rollo, uh, where he demonstrated accessing memory directly via Firewire, um, patching a Windows XP SP2 host to disable a screensaver. So Firewire does provide DMA access, so you could actually dump all memory. Again, the problem is the device has to actually have a Firewire interface in order for this to be used. So we're all getting like, do you remember my arms race slide that I had earlier? Like, yeah, rootkit and rootkit detection, this is very much that. Um, one piece of advice that I always liked is the keep it simple one. Um, custom rootkits, custom things, hardware devices, you can also spawn a shell with bash, and a random bash process running on a box is also not that likely to get noticed and is harder to find. Um, it can be difficult to detect, an experienced examiner would have to be alert for it. Um, again, this is a backdoor someone wrote a while ago in Orc. I just involved spawning an orc interpreter, and you could get a shell using that. Um, I show this because it's cute and has gimmick factor, but um, these days people do it in Python. If you want to spawn a Python interpreter, you can run anything, you know. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip over counter forensics. Uh, but basically the gist is that one should know thy enemy, right? In order to paraphrase a Sun Tzu quote, which is used way too often everywhere. Um, but people should, regardless of the side of the fence they sit on, uh, think about their end game. Um, people think that they're not going to get owned, but in my experience it happens a lot more often than they think. Um, therefore having a plan of what to do and what your attacker might do in order to have gotten there once he's there is a pretty good idea. Um, so you'll be able to see the resources for the research I did for this paper um, when this is published. And has anyone got any questions? <coughs> Anything at all? Yes? What's the coolest, newest thing you've seen? The coolest, newest thing I've seen? Um, Technique-wise, for the hiding. For hiding? Um, I don't know, people don't use like a lot of sort of file system obfuscation techniques these days. Like, 
I, I'd say I guess a lot of techniques involve um, people. Realistically, people are pretty sloppy. Um, in that, in that they, like the recent, um, the recent Kubeface malware, right? That was operating system portable. However, what they did in order to do this was they brought a Java mm. runtime with them. Once it used the exploit and downloaded it, they would download the Java runtime from the internet, from Sun, and then run this massive Java file. Uh, which, I mean, a lot of the times you don't see very elegant anti-forensic technique. Um, however, I mean, there's been some awesome proof of concept polymorphic stuff. Um, like Rustock.c was an absolutely awesome piece of malware. Um, like it's, it's a bit too complicated to go into exactly why now, but it had a variety of anti-analysis mechanisms built into it. Like this, this malware was postulated a couple of years before it was found. Like it was in the wild forever. And that's actually probably one of the nicest pieces of custom uh, obfuscation, reverse engineering, obfuscation. Um, like it, it had a lot of things going on. Um, so there's massive write-ups on that if, if you actually want to see a piece of software that was designed to evade detection and be incredibly difficult to analyze once it was detected. I recommend reading up on that. Uh, anyone else? So you showed some web tools. Um, each of them don't fall partially at least for wiping. Um, so most of the time, I said, so I would use um, there's a tool called Eraser for Windows, which I used for years. Um, there's an S delete, which I think is provided by Sysinternals for Windows. That's pretty good. Uh, Shred, under the GNU Utils thing, has, after it got beaten on by Witsi Benner like a few years ago, it, it works perfectly. It's fixed all its shortcomings. The inbuilt one on OS X actually works, works as well um, for the free tools. Anyone else? Okay, that's me. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Ashley.